Hello and welcome to Unstoppable. I am your host, Kerwin Ray, and today we are talking about storytelling. Do you ever want to tell your business story, but you feel like you have nothing to tell? Do you sometimes feel too shy to put yourself out there? Here's what I've learned as a storyteller. One of the most important things is having a structure and a foundation of something to share. And as an expert storyteller, it won't surprise you that today's guest, Nick Bowditch, is the only person in the Southern Hemisphere to have worked at both Facebook and Twitter. And on this episode, we find out how to be a better storyteller as a business owner, as well as tapping into and looking at things like trauma, addiction, abuse, and how to use some of these aspects of your life to share who you are. Nick is an incredible guy and also an incredible friend. We've been mates actually now since he was back in the Facebook days and we've been through a lot together. This is going to be heavy for some of you out there, but it's also going to be interesting. My advice, check it out. It's going to be good. Listen up. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Unstoppable, the man who actually, when you look at Unstoppable in the dictionary, his face actually appears in there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unstoppable. Nick Bowditch, that's, how are you, brother? That's very kind of you, mate. Thank mate, you. it's very true. Very true. Like, you're someone, um, we've known each other for a few years now. Yes, I can I can um, lay claim to saying that I knew Colonel Ray before he was famous. <laughs> This is true. And you actually worked for Facebook. I did. Yeah. And I remember trying to set up the collaboration. Like, look, we're a big boy here. We don't play with little kids like you. <laughs> they were, I don't know that that's wasn't exactly, exactly how those the conversation words, went. But it was over tacos in the city. It was. It was, yeah. yeah. It was. Um, and I knew then there was probably two or three people working in a similar space to you. And we, we wanted scalability. Like, we wanted to reach a lot of people by me only having to reach one. And... A few people sort of fit that bill, but no one. I didn't develop the relationship that we have yep. with anyone else. You know, the I other know people. that. Yeah, um, and so yeah, it was just kind of a good fit. So for people who don't know who you are, like you are known as the uh, the storyteller, mm-hmm. um, not just because you can weave an incredible story, but you've also got a genetic history that, that, that links back to storytelling. I do. But for people who don't know the the short version of Nick Bowditch in, in 30 seconds or less, and we'll dive into aspects of that story. We won't go into the story now, but just the highlights reel. Uh, what's, what's the Nick Bowditch story? Okay. So I work a lot around storytelling. I'm, I'm good at it and I'm good at encouraging other people to tell their stories. I think it's something that we universally suck at, especially in Australia. Yep. Um, especially in small business too. Um, we tell stories, we tell the wrong stories, we tell the wrong stories to the wrong people and, and so on. So I'm, I'm very big in that. You know, I want, I, want, I want to know somebody's authentic story. I want to tell them mine. That's, that's kind of the place where I come from. And it, so I come from a tech startup background where that was kind of starting to be important. Um, and then I was recruited, as you said, from by Facebook, where I worked for three years, and I ran startup and small business operations um, in this part of the world for that big brand, and it was great fun. And I did that for three years, and then I worked at Twitter after that, um, doing the similar kind of thing, just trying to get small businesses to get the most out of that platform in those early days, which it was early days in those days. So it's kind of ironic, because have you always been – because you work for – two of the most iconic platforms in the social space and when we break down what social media is it's a social form of connection it's a mm. way that we connect and one of the you know the most tried and tested ways of connection that we've had throughout history is through storytelling yep so w- did this just kind of happen serendipitously or was this kind of some master plan no it was a fluke yeah right um in a lot of ways my genetically i kind of my my dad is a great storyteller like a great storyteller and so he i was always kind of in his mold a little bit of being able to engage somebody um and be able to not just engage them to listen to my story but look at someone and go tell me your story you know tell me the real actual story i don't want the brochure shit i don't want the about me page i want to know who you are and, and why you are. And so that kind of just helped me build small businesses. When people weren't really concentrating on it or it wasn't a thing, you know, it was just how I managed to create conversations and engagement with people. And then because the last small business that I had prior to starting Facebook was an agency where we worked a lot with people, you know, on that social storytelling. And, um, and that kind of got Facebook's interest and in, the rest is history. The rest is history, as they say, and it's now carved in uh, the digital yeah. stone that is Facebook. And so, why do you think so many people suck at, st- at storytelling? Two reasons. Yep. I think that we don't know what we don't know. We, we don't necessarily ask, from a small business point of view, we don't ask our business, our, our market, what they want. We, we're kind of self-convinced 
that we know what they want and then we're giving them this, you know, and, and people are like, okay, that's great, but I want a different color of that. That color doesn't suit me. I'm colorblind or, or I want a different size to that. I'm not the size I used to be or, you know, just that interaction, that two-way conversation, which we can have now, but we couldn't have in the billboard days and people still think they're in the billboard days. So they can't adapt, you know. But the second problem, the bigger problem is people don't want to stand up and go, do you know what, Kieran? I'm rad at this. I'm really good at what I do. And that's why I charge this much. And that's just the story of the business this far. This is, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm charging this much. This is why I'm really good at it. You know, but that's, that's not something Australians are, are okay with doing. But if, well, they don't mind doing it from time to time. But if you do that, you become a bit of a target in this country. Yeah, yeah. in this country. But, you know, as you know, I've worked with a lot of North Americans, as, as you have too, and, and they're not encumbered generally by this. It's not because they're big heads. They're just able to go, okay, these are the five things I'm shit at. But these three things, I'm really great at. Mm. And that's, that's the part of storytelling which we struggle with, that, that tall poppy bullshit. So why is storytelling more important now than ever? Oh, because, especially in this post-truth. <laughs> post-truth. <laughs> post-truth period. Fake people, news. People want to know, people want to look behind the curtain. They want to, you know, in small business especially, we are, we are all selling the same thing to the same people for the same price. Now, there's variance in that, but that's kind of what it is. Now, as a consumer, I can see 11 people providing the same thing for the same price at the same, you know, to, the, to me. And I go, okay, well, why would I go with you? Tell me a story. Tell me why. Tell me what it, why it matters to you. Tell me if I give you my $100 for that product. What are you going to do with it? Who's it going to help? Uh, is it going to feed your kids? Tell me about them. Is it going to look after your mother who's ailing and you're caring for her? Tell me about her. Like, I want to know. People want to know. And it's because there's nothing you can't find out. This information is at a surplus, right? There's nothing I can't find out about Kerr and Ray with five minutes on Google. But it's still the brochure shit. Mm. It, it's still that high-level, impersonal generic stuff and I don't care about that and I think more and more people don't care about that they want to know why you know mm. why is it important to you why is it how is it going to change my life tell, tell me that and I'll support you forever that's a really nice way of putting it <clears throat> and I think one of the things I see you know I'm probably not as embedded in social media as what you have been with the roles you have but one of the things I see in social media is how where people fail in this act of storytelling is really in the way that they communicate. And I know that seems pretty fucking obvious, right? It's like saying that, that, that that's why the nose can't sniff because it's blocked. I don't even know if that made any sense. But well, I'm worried now because it did. It did a little bit, but just on the, just on the end bit. Um, but one of the things I see is the social media being misused because it's a social form of media, right? And that's where I think storytelling is so important. It's a social form of media. It's not a direct marketing media. It's not a direct sales media. It's a social form of media. Mm. And how do we as human beings connect socially? We share things about each other. And they're the things that we relate to. We identify common threads, common values. And the deeper those common values, the deeper the connection. And the deeper connection, the greater levels of trust. And the greater levels of trust, the more influential we become. Yeah. So The, the worst thing about social, the, the biggest inhibitor to social media is that it's got media yeah, in right. It, right. So we still like, oh, fuck. Oh, then I have to pretend to be something else. I have to wear a tie. I have to not say fuck. I have to, you know, uh, think about the direct response of this. If I say this, I make this much money. Well, no. If you say this 17 times, it convinces someone maybe to look for the product from you rather than somebody else. Like that's the hardest thing. People want, people want the metric, right? People want, if I say this, about this product which might cost $100 and it cost me $50 to say it and you pay me, I get $50. That's this transactional thing that we're used to because of media. We can't, we can't get away from it. Social media just means another form of media and it's, it's just not. It's, it's the extension of us. And this is something that you do really well and I do well is showing people what else happens Showing people, us training, us with our kids, us when, it, when things go tits up. Like, that's the stuff I want to see. And what's interesting, that's the most popular stuff. Of course it is. Honestly. And, you know, people say, well, it's drama. But it's, I don't think it's just the drama. I think it's that relativity. It's the ability to relate. And they go, 
well shit here's this guy you know ex-facebook guy ex-twitter guy shit he's got he's got he suffers from mental health issues just like me he has bad days just like me Kerwin fucks up just like me and that's what i believe is the most important aspect of the story 100 percent. if 11, yeah. 11 people are selling the same product the yeah. same price and one person's honest <laughs> and real and authentic who who are people going to spend their money with yeah, it seems like an obvious choice i mean there's some percentage of people who go for the glossy shit Always, because they want to, they want the reassurance that Kerwin Ray doesn't fuck up, right? But okay, there's a very small percentage of people. The rest of us just want to know, just want to peek behind the curtain. Just show me what it's really like. Don't show me a, a, a cavalcade of fuck ups forever and ever. But show me when it's hard. You know, show me the days when, from me, from my point of view, people want to see the days when I'm doing well, and they want to see the days when I can't get out of bed. Mm. You know. Not because there's something physically wrong with me. Something is is in my mind at that time con- controlling my body that I just can't get out of bed. And you, of all people, you're incredibly open. Like, you talk very openly about your issues with yeah. mental health. You talk very openly about your issues with addiction. How have those things played out in terms of where you are right now as, you know, as this guy who teaches people how to share their story? Um, it's encouraged other people because people see me as going first. People see me as giving them permission to talk about their own mental skillness, you know, their own um, superpowers, as I yeah. as I talk about them all the time. You know, the upgrades. Yeah, I mean, look, anybody who lives with the stuff that I live with. What do you live with? Then you're very open. So to I, yeah, so I live with depression, anxiety, PTSD. Yep. Um, they're the th- kind of the <laughs> that's the trifecta. For <laughs> that's the, the headlines. And, yeah, and I'm also an addict, so yep. I, I live with addiction in many forms. But um, you know, I. I live with these things and I think words have power. I don't know whether I learned this from you actually, but words have power. So I don't, I don't say I suffer from yep. or I battle against because when I make it adversarial, me versus depression, depression's too fucking big and I, it's going to win, right? So if I just say, okay, I just, I live with this and I use that vernacular, that terminology all the time and I use it with other people and, and, when I get up on a stage in front of you know a room of people and say, two weeks ago, I couldn't get out of bed for three days. There was nothing physically wrong with me. I just could not make my legs go over the side of the bed to stand up. I did not want to see the sun, whatever it might be. There's three people in the audience, three sorts of people. One, people who go, oh, stop talking about that. You know, they look really uncomfortable and they're shifting their seat and they, don't, they can't, they don't want real, right? And there's, they want the brochure. No. And there's some people who will just look at you like, oh, that must be terrible. I have no idea what you're talking about. They're the, they're the lucky ones. Good for them. And then there's other people who look at me and I, and I look at them, you know, and we see each other. And, and you can just see someone looking at me and going, fuck, man, you are telling my story. That's, that's me. That's the stuff that I live with as opposed to suffer from. And so, and I know from how many people have come up to me at an end of a gig after I finished on stage and, and people walk up to me and tell me something, disclose something to me, their childhood abuse history or their Which, alcoholism. Which, by the way, naturally or, happens, doesn't it? Like, oh. By you sharing and being as vulnerable as what you do, you, like you said earlier, it gives people massive levels of permission to do the same. Yep. But what's the interesting ingredient in between that, 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 that vulnerability and that reciprocity is trust. Yeah. And that that's that's the that's the that's the juice, right? Oh, a hundred percent. Now, whether whether we talk about this from a relationship context or a commercial context or a profit context, none of those things revolve consistently unless there's a high or a good level of trust. Yep. But it seems so counterintuitive. Yeah, and and it, you won't and because of that, you won't get it from Most everyone. People. Yeah. Um, some people, as I said, some people are shifting their seat. They're they're very really uncomfortable with. Me. With no, because, because maybe because they're sitting there thinking oh, I'm successful, whatever that means like, to them. Yep. Um, they don't want me to be broken or wounded. They want me to be perfect, right? Because their aspiration is to be perfect. My aspiration is to be fucking. My, my aspiration stopped a long time ago at, at wanting <laughs> to be perfect. Um, you know, I I I, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be valuable. Mm. I'm just trying to be provide useful. some value. That's that's yeah. all. Um, if I try to be perfect, I'll fail. If I fail, then I sink down that rabbit hole of I'm shit, I'm worthless, I'm no good, and I end up, you know, in active addiction. Okay, that's as that's as straightforward as it is for me. 
if I do this, it's a bit like, you know, I come from a programming background. The programming language is very basic as, you know, if this, then that. If this happens, then that happens. Yeah. And then that happens, and then that happens. And the fourth thing will never happen unless that first thing happens. So I just have to be mindful of that. But, you know, I, I love it when people come up and tell me something. I mean, I don't love it because it's, sometimes it's horrendous things that people tell you they've been through. But I, But then they say... And you're the only person on earth who knows that. Mm. And I go, mate, I shouldn't be. You know, please don't let that happen forever. Sort of thing, you know, when, when people, people disclose the most amazing trauma to me. And, 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 and I know that it's the first time they've ever said it out loud. And it's only, it's not because I am a great speaker or anything else. It's just because I got up on stage in front of people and said, you know what, this is me. This is my shit. Here we go. And as you said, I am an oversharer. <laughs> but you, know, you and me both. Yeah. We yeah. Both, yeah, we do actually yeah. both have that in common. But, you know, I'm happy with that. I, I, I can deal with the wound to my ego, the petty bullshit that, that I think, oh, I don't want to say that today because someone might think I'm whatever. I can deal with that. If, if I know there's 10 people in a room of 1,000, 10 people who might just seek to change their life because of something they've heard me say, then I'll take the bruised ego and the little bit of embarrassment and the healthy shame of that. I don't care. I'm not, and I'm not magnanimous. I'm not being like- No, I get it. Superheroes about this stuff. You know, I just think 10 people might change their life. And that's that's where the value is. Let's get practical for a second and not to say that this isn't, but I, I think that there might be three types of people- You who and me being practical. Get off the couch. <laughs> Because there's probably three types of people listening, right? The yeah. people that are listening is going, oh, fuck, I'm not sure if this podcast is for me. Mm. Oh, fuck, that must be a little bit uncomfortable. And people go, oh, I can really connect to that. Mm. And for the first two that are perhaps still listening, because I think the third person is going to listen anyway, because they're, yeah. they're raptured, they're captured, they're, they're, we've got their attention. They might be thinking, oh, fuck, okay, I, I'm starting to understand the importance of storytelling. Storytelling is important, but I don't have depression. I don't have anxiety. I don't have PTSD. I don't have addiction. How do I share stories that are as interesting as captivating as others when you know i had this one person this morning so what's the biggest challenge you ever deal with and, and they were like oh, fuck, um well i broke up with my boyfriend once and i was like okay not everybody has challenge no. at the levels that you know some people like you and i have and so when it comes to creating an art a story arc or a story or you know even just a, you know something to talk about for a piece of content to connect deeper with clients and they don't have that perhaps wounded history where do people start okay so firstly i just want to say one thing sure it's not a competition yes and because uh, then it becomes a race to the bottom uh, absolutely yeah which i'll lose because i'll get there before you don't yeah. worry <laughs> fuck you i'll you know I'll, my life is worse than yours yeah. man let's just put it up on a whiteboard yeah, that's right you know um and for some people that relationship breakdown as you said is the most devastating thing they've ever encountered and maybe ever will yeah that's still trauma you know, it's this still a, this. It's still important. Good point. Um, but if you don't, if you th- if you're sitting there thinking, "Oh shit, my life's all rainbows and lollipops," great, it might be. But I still want to know what's going on. I still want to know how you feel about that. Tell me, how you, you know, tell me how it feels to feel like you haven't had any major trauma in your life. You feel lucky. You feel fortunate. That's great. I'm not, as someone who has had stuff to deal with. I don't look at people who've had nothing to deal with, although I don't think those people exist, but the people who say they've got nothing to deal with, I don't look at them and go, well, fuck you, I hate you. I go, wow, that's interesting. Tell me about the difference in our life. And from a business point of view, I still want to know, I still want to know what goes behind building something. I still want to know what is important to you. I want to know how you feel about climate change. I want to know how you feel about refugees. I want to know, you know, all this stuff matters. If I'm buying a little widget from you for $25, it still matters to me how you feel about those things because it won't stop me. If, if, if we have a differing view on asylum seekers, I'm not going to not buy from you. I'm going to buy from you knowing that we have that difference and, and isn't that great that we have a connection aside from something that other people think is a deal breaker. Those things aren't deal breakers to me. If you're unkind, then yeah, that's a deal breaker. If you don't operate from a, from a heart-centered place of kindness, then fuck you, I'm not, I'm not dealing with you. But not everyone's that brave, Nick. So for someone who's sitting there going, oh fuck, it's all right for you, you've got everything out there. And I'm playing Dazzle's advocate here, please, mm. I hope you see that. Mm. Good, because that's not true. But yeah. <laughs> 
No, that is because there are some people I see that go, well, fuck, you know, I know you're telling me to put my stuff out there, but I am afraid of rejection. And you tell me, you know, rejection, you know, failure is nothing to be afraid of. It's all feedback. You can all, what's the bad, you know, there's so many ways that we can handle it. What do you say to the person who's just sitting there terrified going, look, I'm just not sure I can just be that open. Do you know what? It's really simple. You're, fa- you're afraid of rejection? Tell me about that. Tell me why. What's, what's led to that? Why, why are you afraid of it? And they'll be like, oh, whatever. Is the, what the, and that's the connection. That's the point where we say, okay, I'm not afraid of that. And this is why. Let's, let's talk. Let, you know, let's communicate with each other. Let's connect to each other. I, I, you don't ha- it's not a competition. You don't, I, I'm only, we, are good, we are really good mates and we've had some shit to deal with, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm equally good mates. Well, I had so much more shit well, than Of course you, you do. So, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. win. <laughs> um, but I'm equally connected to other people who seemingly have no yeah. downsides in their life. I don't, look, I don't think anyone, if you define trauma as having a less than nurturing childhood, 100% less than nurturing, then we've all, we've all come from a place of trauma. We've all got stuff to deal with. No parent is perfect. I'm not. You're not. Our parents weren't perfect. They did the best they could, but that wasn't good enough, right? And that's hard. Mm. But when you get to that point of going to your parents, I know that you did your very, very best. It wasn't good enough. And now I have to reparent myself in these little areas that I, to help me live. That's not a slight to my parents. It's an acknowledgement that they're not perfect. And it, and it just takes that pressure off. <laughs> takes pressure off them and then it takes pressure off me because I'm not a perfect parent either and you know what my kids aren't perfect and they're not going to be perfect parents either and as soon as we can strip back and go this is this is the human condition now this is the human condition that we are not perfect and we can just all stop fucking trying to be and accept ourselves for who we are and try try better I, I don't I don't try to be perfect I don't try to be great I try to be better than I was yesterday and mostly I'm not because some days I have great days and then I have shit days after it but tomorrow I'm going to try and be better than I was today and the next day and the next day and the next day and if I'm in there swinging then nobody you know I can't do any better than that I don't think I don't think anyone wakes up and goes you know what today I'm going to half ass it fuck it I'm not going to try to be my best you know Somebody who's a serial killer or some, you know, some terrible monster, I think that they are still doing their best with what they have and where they've come from and the trauma they've been through and, and the way the world sees them and their opportunities and whatever. They're not doing their, anything less than their best. Their best just isn't good enough for the rest of us. That's a big difference. Because if I, if, if I don't like you because I think you're not doing your best, then join the line because there's thousands of people who I'm not going to think that. Mm. But if I go to you, if you've hurt me and I say to myself, okay, you that fucking hurt. I, I'm, I resent you for that. I feel angry about that. But I also accept that in that moment, you were doing the best you could possibly do. It wasn't good enough for me at that moment, but it was the best you can do. I can't get you to do any better than your best. It's really hard, that. Especially if someone has abused you or hurt you or continues to hurt you um, or let you down or whatever. It's really hard to... You don't have to forgive them. I don't have to forgive... I don't don't have to forgive the person who abused me as a kid. I want to fucking kill him. You know, I'm not going to... I'm never going to forgive him. But I can accept that in that moment he was doing his best. Now I can accept that. <laughs> and it just makes it easier for me to do mine. Yeah, right. What's the greatest lesson you've learned from all the trauma? Like the mental illness, the addiction. Well, what's, what's the biggest takeaway, mate? That I'm still here. Yeah. That I, you know, that I was able to get out of bed, get dressed, come to Sydney. God. You're welcome. And sit with you and do this. Like, what a gift. You know, that the fact that, you know, it hasn't stopped me. And today, tomorrow it might. <laughs> Last week it did, you know. But, um, but I'm able to, you know, my favourite quote 
you know I love fucking quotes. My favourite quote is the Carl Jung quote, you know, um, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. And every day, every morning I open my eyes and I make that choice. I can choose to be the junky, flaky, crazy person who lets everyone down, is really unreliable, is really depressed and really anxious and a sexual abuse victim and blah, blah, blah. Or I can choose to be who I want to be today. And that's somebody who is just trying to do his best until 6 a.m. tomorrow. And then tomorrow I'll, I'll do the same thing. Start again. Yeah. Reset every day. What is addiction and um, all this? What has everything taught you about parenting? I think it's, um, God, so Cause, much. Because you've, you've, you obviously have you've done enough work to see that know the connections. Oh. Yeah. We, we, we. And I look at my four children and think, okay, genetically – there's probably a pre, pretty good job, pretty good chance that at least one of them is going to also share genetically the same predisp- predispositions I share towards different things. So I have to be... Are I you ha- familiar with Gabor Matei's work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar, okay. Similar, similar, kind, yeah, right. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, can, I can disrupt that or I can accept it if it happens. And, you know, I, that's, that's what addiction's given me. Yep. In terms of my parenting, I can go... I'm going to... I grew up in a, in a generation... That was lied to by their parents. We both did. N- not malicious things, but, you know, your parents didn't talk about the first time they had sex or the first time they smoked weed if they did or yeah, they, they just didn't tell you this stuff when you didn't ask, right? But this generation, our kids, they're asking. And, and if I'm, you don't tell them, they're fucking Googling it. Yep. And they'll find out and they're, you know, they're, they're going to be way better detectives than we ever were. <laughs> so, I, I, and I, in regards of that, I want to tell my kids. Mm. I want to tell my kids all of the things, all of my superpowers, all of those character defects that some people call it, you know, because there's a good chance some, they're going to carry some of them, maybe. And even if they don't, it explains my behavior. It explains the way I parent. It explains my expectations of them. Um, if I think about your question of what addiction has given me, it's an understanding of myself, which will help them understand me as well, mm. as well as me understanding them. I, I, I don't think they're going to be perfect. I, I don't want them to be. Um, I will. I am more vigilant in some areas with them and less vigilant in others because of that addiction. I, I'm going to tell my kids exactly what I've smoked, exactly what I've drunk, exactly what I've done. Um, you know, at an age appropriate <laughs> time and place, because I don't want them finding out they're an addict the way I found out. You know, they're, they're still going to do those things, right? My kids are still going to smoke a spliff. No, I will too. At some stage, he's going to be in a situation where he's going to do something which, you know, and I don't want that surrounded by shame. <laughs> I don't want that to be the the wick on the bomb that is addiction. I want them to going, I'm making the decision to use this substance or to do this process or whatever it might be in the full understanding that it might not be great, but part of my self-actualizing as a human is that I try this today or I don't. Um, I'm not going to be shamed into thinking it's no good and, and whatever because my dad told me what it does for him, what it did to him what it took from him. Um, I'm sure you go, it's pretty brave. To, for your kids? Well, to be able to have those conversations with your kids. Well, mate, I don't know. If you can't have it with kids, then you're not oh, having it with anyone. I'm not disagreeing. Please, and please don't, don't, don't miss, I get miss, I, no, miss, I get take my, my, uh, my tone. It's certainly not skepticism. It's, it's one of appreciation. And I've seen firsthand, like I had a mate recently that um, – you know, his daughter is of age um, and she decided to, you know, try drugs for the very first time. And so rather than him shame her and guilt her, you know, he actually created an environment where it was very safe for her to talk about it and created an environment where he made it safe for her to actually try it. Hmm. And I know how shocking some people, and I know that this is probably going to get, you know, a bit, a, bit of, a bit of backlash for some people, but I just, my level of respect went up massively because not only did he provide the facilities to be able to test the drugs to make sure that they were actually 
what she thought they were, but he actually created a safe environment for her to actually explore something she's going to do anyway. And rather than doing it at a party where if something had gone wrong, you know, who knows what access to, to help she would have had, it was done within his own home mm. under, a supervised, you know, sup- under the supervision of an adult. And I know exactly how many people will be turning over right now going, that's just, that's child. It's, look, the child was of age. The kid was of age. She's not a kid. Okay, but she's old enough to, to make her own decisions. And I think what I find interesting is the relationship that these two have now. It was already incredible, but it's just even better. And what's interesting is her desire to experiment with drugs has now pretty much gone. Yeah. Because yeah the only reason I wanted to try drugs as a kid was because I was told not to. Yeah, exactly, right? Or do anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just, I think, I, 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 I'm not a believer in treating your children like adults. Children should be children, right? Absolutely. But I am a believer in not treating them like they're fucking idiots. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's that's where I come from. Like, I think my kids are pretty smart. They're already pretty smart. And they're going to be smarter than me. So I, 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 could, I could hang on and try to be <laughs> the smartest guy in the room. I'm just not going to be. So I have to prepare for that. And I think when they were really little, I, well, when, before they were born, I thought I, I want to be my kid's hero. I want to be perfect for them. I want them to look at me thinking the sun shines out of my ass, right? And as my life has gone on through having them and through being addicted to things and almost losing everything, literally everything, I've come to the point now where I don't need the, they don't, I don't need them to see me as perfect. I need to, I need them to see me as my, as their dad. I don't, I'm not their best friend. I'm not their friend. They've got friends who are their age. I don't, I've got friends who are my age. I don't need them to be my friend. I need them to be my children and for me to be the parent and for that to be a, a dynamic that we have that allows them to see that I'm un- imperfect and me for it to see that, that they are, that they know they can tell me things. You know, I, I have a, a big glue with one of my mates at Christmas because when my six-year-old asked me if Santa was real, do any kids listen to this? No. Uh, my six-year-old asked me if Santa was real, like that, and I said no. Because I'm not going to lie to her. Like, it seems like a pedantic little thing. Did they thing. still believe anyway? Yes. yes exactly. The so- magic was still there. <laughs> it is still there now. But they just, yeah. they know that their dad isn't lying to them. Yeah. And so they know at some level, that they don't have to lie to me. And it could be, fuck it, it's the Santa was just a good example, but yep. it's, I'm just not lying to them. I'm not going to lie to them. Even even if it's something that's, you know, you think, oh, couldn't you just lie? Would it kill you? So just, what has addiction and trauma and, and mental illness taught you about relationships? That I'm not very good at them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not. I, I, I expect. You sure about that? Yeah, hundred percent. Are you are you saying uh, in, my, not, in my present form? Right. Is it not that you're not good at relationships, or there's certain contexts of relationships that you're not very good at? Because I have to say, as a mate, you're a pretty good mate. You know, whenever I've reached out, you've always been there. Whenever yeah, you've okay, reached that's, out, that's I, nice you know, I'd like to think I've always been there. You know, but I guess one of the things I understand is sometimes for people with addiction or other other super superpowers certain context, proximity of relationships, intimate relationships typically bring up the issues that we're trying to resolve the most, which to me, it's like a, it's like a catch 22. You yeah, know, it really is. One of the things I've learned, you know, as, as an, as an addict and someone with superpowers is when I'm in close proximity in an intimate relationship, it often will bring my stuff up, but there's two, one or two things that we can do when our stuff gets brought up, it, it can either be used as a weapon against us by ourselves and by others or it can be used as an opportunity to actually identify what needs to heal. Mm. And so for me, I actually learned this through fasting because I used to fast uh, and I still do fast. I intermittent fast on a daily basis. But going back from 2000 to like 2015, I used to uh, take out two, two blocks of time every year where I'd just not eat any food, any, anything for seven to ten days, twice a year. Nothing but water, right? And one of the things I noticed when I did it myself is all these anxieties would come up. All these uh, uncomfortable emotions would come. Day two, day three, day four, day five. I'd be like, fucking hell, I just want to eat. And what, what I discovered was 
I was using food as a as a drug. It was like a panacea. It was like something I was using to suppress emotions. And once I removed the emotion, once I removed the food, the emotions came up to the surface. And it was much like going clean for the first time. Mm. You know, all the I was just going to say it is exactly. Yeah, that. You know, whatever we're using the drug to suppress, it comes up to the surface. But that's the beauty. That to me is the beauty. It's when the stuff comes because when the stuff's suppressed, we can't see it. So how how can we work on something we can't see? And that's where I think, you know, as addicts, the opportunity for us, actually, the greatest opportunity I'm recognizing with myself actually lies in relationships. But it's being of right state of mind to go into a relationship in order to be able to do the work. I think the challenge with most addicts is they go into a relationship unprepared to do the work that the relationship brings up. And as a result, we fucking blow them up. 100%. Because we want instant gratification. Yeah. And, and we, we only get it for so long. Yeah. Or we, or we never get it yeah. because people are like, oh, you're kind of a dick. Like. I don't. I don't really work, want to work through all this shit with you. And that's okay too. But I, I want people to love me. I want everyone to love me first of all. But I want them to do that in thirty seconds. Yeah. And with me really having not done very much work, if that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you know that's the that's the addict in me, yeah. and I and I want more and more of that because that's the addict in me too. But uh, addiction addiction can only live in disconnection. It can't. Addiction can't survive in an environment where I am connected to self or community, that's, that's its fuel, man. That's, for me, that's its fuel. If I, and every time I get disconnected, and I'm trying to do that all the time, I'm trying to disconnect all the time. I want to live on my island on my own. I, I can't. But that's the addict. Of course it is. Yep. But, but you know, that it, when other people won't let you be disconnected, that's yeah. That's that's when relationships for me. That's when relationships suffer for me. But I, I don't know. I think I'm getting better at it. I think as I'm evolving, like if if somebody wanted to have a, a an intimate relationship with me when I'm 60, I think I'll be pretty rad at it by then. So because <laughs> I'll probably be pretty harmless by then too. But you know, you know. But I think, but again, because I think a lot of people look at addiction and they go, "Oh fuck, I'm not an addict." But you know, one of the things I've identified is addiction. Addiction is a spectrum condition. You know, it's as mild as, you know, having to check your phone 50 times a day. You know, it's as mild as, you know, having to buy something on eBay every single day. It's as mild as, you know, needing to wash your face, wash your hands every single time you, you, you touch something else. But one of the things that I've learned about addiction is it's often a condition that everybody shares in, on some level. But it's not until we're put into the situations where, you know, whatever it is that we need is removed that we actually get to see the opportunity that's there. But it, it requires a very high level of self-awareness. And so for me... Personally, I actually have been taking the time out of relationships, like since I uh, separated my wife, to actually give myself the space to go, okay, let's get to know me first. Because I think one of the biggest challenges, it's like you said before, it's a connection issue. And, and who's the greatest, con- or like what's the, mo- what's the primary connection yeah. we have? It's with self. Yeah. And in order for us to be healthy, anyway, this is just my perspective, is we need to learn how to connect with ourselves before we can even consider connecting I'm, with the I'm healthy. totally on board with that. Like in the, in the 12 step community they talk about addiction being defined by um, your life becoming unmanageable, unmanageable and that you are feeling helpless against dot 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 whatever whatever it is you identify as the identif- uh, addicting agent, right? I I think that's way too black and white for me <laughs> because as you said I, I believe it's a spectrum thing too and you know people can be addicted to merit at first sight. It's not going to fucking kill them. Maybe, <laughs> but you know that's that's still, if you can't not do it, you know, or if you feel compelled to do it more than more than is available to you in a healthy way, then the, then you're on the spectrum, man. How do you feel about the concepts within AA and the twelve steps where where they identify as I am an addict and I am powerless? How do you identify those concepts? Because they're the two concepts that I I find the most challenging. I know you do, and. I'm going to fly in the face of that and say that is what saved my life. Yeah, right. Uh, you talk about the connection to self and self-awareness. Uh, I can sit in a in a room, of, you know, an, a 12-step meeting room, and I can sit there and think, what the fuck am I doing in the same room as these people? Look at, look at how hopeless they are. Look at how whatever. And then, you know, it'll go around the circle and someone will say, Oh, I'm John. I'm 14 years clean, you know. And I think, oh fuck, I'm the junkie. <laughs> oh, I'm the, you know, like yeah. it's up and down. This better than, less than stuff yeah. um, comes from that disconnection. So, to answer your question, if I can say I am powerless, 
my life is unmanageable. I am an addict. That's very strengthening for me to be able to get that self-awareness around it. It doesn't let me off the hook. It doesn't let me negotiate and bargain because then I'll go, I could probably just have this or maybe I'll try that. This once won't hurt. Yeah. What's the harm? It's yeah. just once. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody's ever going to know about it. That's my big one. Nobody's going to know. Yeah. And that's true. But I'll fucking know. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I say that I don't have a problem with alcohol, but given enough time and given enough opportunity, I'll absolutely have a problem with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I just, yeah, I, right. I just don't go near it. You know, I just, yeah, I I just provide that, that moat. Between yeah. me and it the at the moment. Yeah. Till six AM tomorrow. Yep. And then I'll see how it goes. So if there's one message you would like to leave with people, like what do you see as your legacy? Oh I want people like on my tombstone type sure. my obituary. Eulogy, tombstone. Um what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered as somebody who was eventually honest. Lying was my superpower for a long time to different people about stupid shit and then big things. But that was how I hid my trauma, hid who I was. So I would like people to say he was honest, um, he was authentic, and he was kind. If everything else in my life fell apart from this point on, and even if I descend back into active addiction, right? As long as I am honest, authentic, and kind, I will be doing my very best, and I'll be good to be around, and I'll be good for my kids to be related to. Um, where any of those three fail or drop away, that's when I'm in trouble. And I know, as a as a self metric, I know that when I don't start, when I start to not feel that, when I start to think think unkind things or do unkind things, that's the, that's the top of the slippery dip for me. And it doesn't take much of a push to get me on the slippery dip, <laughs> as we've talked about. <laughs> you know, I don't need much encouragement. So I just need to be honest, authentic, and kind. And if I'm that, if I'm, if I'm honest, authentic, and kind, and you don't like me, then fuck, man, I can't, I can't do anything else. I'll just have to accept that. And so that's that's my legacy. I want, I, I don't I don't want other people to be that. I don't need other people to be that. I need to be honest, mm. authentic, and kind. Well, if there's three things that I know about you, mate, since the relationship that we've had in the last five years, you're very honest, mate. Mate, you've yeah. met me at the right time in my well, life. Well, you've always been honest. You've <laughs> always been honest with everything and every every step where you're at the whole way through. Thanks, mate. And you've always been authentic. You know, you've never shied away from sharing with everything that's been going on mm. in your world. And you're honestly one of the kindest human beings I know, mate. You Thank really you. are. You know, you've always been there for me as a mate, as a friend, you know, uh, as, a, as a fellow addict. And, yeah, I want to say thank you, mate, because you're a bloody good bloke. And it's good to see you starting to see, see that as well because uh, you deserve it, pal. Thank you, mate. It's very kind of you. Best piece of advice you want to leave people with? Be authentic. <laughs> Be honest. Be kind. Just well, yeah. Be off, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, authenticity is the, is, is the number one for me. If yep. people if people can't handle you as you are, fuck them. Yeah. Let God sort them out. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Nick Bowditch on Unstoppable. Nick, thank you so much for coming in, brother. You're very welcome, mate. You're a good man. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media, at Kerwin Ray.